Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ABZ show with me, Abe. Today, I have a very special guest, Hamad. How are you, Hamad? Doing well. Great. Excited to be on. Thanks for having me, for sure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I know, you know, our relationship is uh, relatively very young, but I know uh, we've had a couple of conversations and they've been very, very insightful. So tell me, Hamad, tell me more what you do and what are you passionate about? Uh, the way I like to explain this is, is uh, there are two moments in my life kind of that define me. And the first started early on. I was uh, 21, 20, I think. And I gradu graduated from college uh, with a computer and telecom engineer. And the market, the telecom market in Bahrain deregulated uh, just kind of recently. So it was kind of calling to start a telecom company. So I started a telecom company and, you know, through ups and downs. Uh, I grew it to 25 million revenue per year, nice. uh, which was pretty high for that time. Uh, kind of putting me on the track to kind of tech entrepreneurship, you know, with companies that follow. That was kind of the first kind of lucky break, I think. It was a timing and not a lot of competition at that time. Uh, the second, I would say, was recent, around 2016 to 2017. Uh, I was part of a huge acquisition. Uh, by a Chinese multi-billion company of a startup. Um, it's still kind of in the NDA. I can talk a bit about it, but um, I was part of the proof of concept and kind of bringing them together and the investment proposal. This kind of introduced me to a lot of investors, uh, business owners, uh, high net uh, individuals, high net worth individuals and government officials in China. And you know, from then I was part of a lot of large inbound investments. Uh, in real estate, industrial acquisitions, projects, and of course, technology and technology startups, which is, you asked me what's, what I'm passionate about. Uh, I follow my true passion today. Every single week, I, I dedicate around 16 to 20 hours now, uh, wow. sitting down with startups, uh, working with incubators, uh, giving lectures. Uh, I advise kind of the startup ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem, I like to call it. And I guess part of it was, uh, you know, I miss my startup days. I think you can relate to that. Yep. Um, and another part of it is kind of a sense of giving back to the community, you know, uh, being part of the change that is going on around us, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I lecture on um, product analytics, uh, product development, uh, fundraising. Um, I also advise some angel investors, family businesses, corporations on uh, innovation investments as well. It's kind of the summary of what I, and I love doing what I'm doing currently, for sure. Wow, that's fantastic. And so when we talked about earlier, like you are a pillar in in, in your ecosystem, and I know you're in Bahrain, uh, that that does a lot, you know, when you're working with both, you know, angel networks and investments and working with the startup side and the corporates, you kind of cover the whole value chain, buddy. So you are, you know, you are there. Let's Let's go back a bit and talk about your early days when you said, when the market deregulated, especially when the telco market deregulated and then, you know, it was open and then you saw an opportunity. And, you know, I think that's something there. I'm, I'm sure, you know, growing your business to a $25 million business, you went through a lot of ups and downs. I'm guessing because every business uh, goes through that. My first business, I can tell you the first two and a half to three years were pretty crappy. I have to say, you know what I mean? Like it was like thinking of salaries, thinking of, okay, we, I just need that break. I need that first customer. You know what I mean? Tell me more about that. You know, when I, when I started my business, uh, I didn't call it a startup, you know, back sure. then. The, uh, I was barely 21. And, you know, I thought I knew it all. You know, you, you graduate, you're, you know, educated. Okay, you know, I'm going to start a company. And there was no YouTube videos telling you, how, you know, what equipment to buy, yep. uh, how to hire, uh, you know, how to start a telecom company, what to do and when. We didn't have AWS uh, and setting up kind of any internet business uh, required kind of capital, right? I remember kind of dragging servers uh, to a UK data center and hooking up the power and the ethernet cables myself, you know, just to get my server up and running. Uh, you know, most of my friends, uh, you know, they got high paying banking jobs. Uh, and I decided to hook up servers in chilly London. Imagine that. You yeah. Know? Uh, you know, at that time, it wasn't really cool uh, to open a company. 
uh, you know, the local paper, you know, the local newspaper, they weren't really interested in what I was doing. Uh, entrepreneurship was not really celebrated to that point. It's, oh, he has a business, you know, especially in our region. And it's funny that, um, you know, today we are kind of like, a, uh, we're in a bubble, I like to say, okay. you know, everyone has a cousin, a friend, a sister, a brother who has a startup, you know, yeah. and, you know, the regions kind of uh, governments are helping out with their fund of funds and, and their programs and so forth. Uh, and we have kind of many startups uh, and even more international kind of investors who who are coming into the, to the ecosystem and kind of creating a lot of noise in the system. So don't get me wrong, Abe, you know, it's, there's no better time uh, to start a business. There's yeah. no better time because you have all these support kind, kind of uh, things going on. You know, even, you know, startup bootcamp, uh, which uh, you're heading, uh, the reason they came in is because of the government support. Mm. And we have fund of funds ready to say, you know what, come here, we'll support you. We're, we're, we're going to be your, your first investors. Yep. So that's the reason many of us in the ecosystem is so thriving. Yep. But at the same time, um, uh, you know, we said unfiltered, right? Yeah. So I'm going to be unfiltered. It attracts great founders, but it also kind of brings, I guess, crowds of low quality founders and low quality investors as well. It's, it's kind of a standard thing, right? There's a lot of hype. So, so this is what happens. And it kind of creates a noise uh, that you have to kind of dig through, yeah. uh, you know, to recognize what's, what's true uh, innovation, what's not, and so forth, you know? It does bring in a lot of clutter, you know what I mean? And it also brings in, like, you know, other than that, like, the low quality of both investors mm. and uh, startups, it also brings in vultures. Like, I'll give you a small example. The second, uh, I talked to a lot of founders, you know, and we had a, and started a boot camp, we have over 110 investments in Mina. The second anybody posts, even if they raised 50K and they, people find mm -hmm. out, you have all these vultures calling this person saying, ah, oh, let me build something for you for X, Y. And, and I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> turn these people away. These are vultures. They're not going to add any value. You know what I mean? And, and sadly, it's true, you know, that whenever you put the eyes on something, it attracts the good and bad. You know what I mean? But you have to maneuver around that or else, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much burn your whatever you've raised. So I agree 100% on what you're saying. Yeah. You know, it's important for startups and, you know, part of my, I always tell my advisees, right? It's important for you to step away from the noise and kind of stand out, you know, from the crowd, you know, uh, being conventional means blending in, which means kind of following these vultures, right? Following kind of what everybody else is doing. Uh, and unconventional is a particular word for me that I live by. Something that I've kind of held with myself since 2010. Okay. And it means not following the pack right? Not following what everybody's following. Now, 98%, Abe, and I'm going to say this, of startups are kind of following a procedure, you know, following the motion of what it means to be a startup. Yeah. So we should have a pitch, a shiny logo, a catchy name, a colorful office eventually, yeah. you know, and guess what? Every, their pitch looks exactly like every other pitch. Yeah. And their kind of actions look the same. They all kind of calculate their market size the same way. Mm. And everybody's uh, presenting their problem the same way and so forth. And part of it is because, and, I'm, and when you talk about vultures, you're talking about vultures who are kind of uh, trying to take advantage, take money from, the, uh, from startups. That's for sure. But there are also incubators and advisors that are giving bad advice. Yeah. You know? Uh, and most, can, there are many advisors that treat startups like sheep in a herd yep. of sheep, I guess. Yep. And a lot of advice is about conformity right to a process for example you know your problem solution market and ask everybody should have an ask yeah of course you follow these steps talk to investors Every, thousands of startups are being pushed down this kind of chain of kind of following the same thing now if you talk to a vc right and you ask the vc what they want they will agree with the conformity because it makes their job easier you know a vc will never tell you be unconventional no of course be creative because they understand there's a lot of garbage startups out there, right? Mm. And they don't want to sift through a decorated garbage. Mm. Don't decorate your garbage and make it, you know, nice. Just get to the point. Let me know if you're worth my time. Yep. 
you know, what's the problem? What's the solution? Tick the checkboxes, right? Yep. Saves me time in deciding whether you're worth my time or not. But the dark truth is that they're actually waiting to be wowed, right? And we are waiting for the excitement of, of what it means to kind of invest in innovation. It's not about kind of um, talking about, I'm not talking about like a, having a colorful pitch sure. or, or, or some animation. No, I'm talking about being formidable, being insightful when discussing your startup when 99% of startups are not. They're kind of following the, you know, the motions. They're not even convinced yep. of what they're saying. Yep. And this applies, I guess, to, to everything. You, I mean, you know this, right? To fundraising, to building your product, to, to kind of talking to customers. And those that stand out and walk this kind of unique path, right? They have considerable success uh, to those that kind of walk the codified, you know, this is what it means to be a startup, which unfortunately most of them do. I, I agree 100% that whole templated approach. It, it's because, you know, it's it's the calculated risk, as you said earlier. You know that, you know, the teaser deck has to be X amount of slides, mm -hmm. has to have all these. It's just because it literally makes it into a factory, out, um, a, you know, kind of uh, output where a VC would look in and say, okay, check, 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 check. And, let, and then we'll call them up if we like the founders, they have whatever and then we'll get another call a meeting and and so on it, it the sad truth my first startup um well my first startup was in 1999 so that's that was a long time ago but my the the big one um in 2006 when we i started raising um i remember uh an investor told me something and i told him like and and please don't quote me for this but i said oh i swim again uh, upstream not downstream because I'm going to do things differently. You know what I mean? And uh, even in, in, in Jordan to raise a million dollars in 2006 for a startup. Yeah, man. That's, How do you do it? That's, that was, and that's what, you know, we stuck our guns, the founders and I, um, you know, my, my co-founders at that time, we like, we were swinging, like, like people didn't understand what, what is this technology thing that I have to pay yeah. a million, you know what I mean? And I, I totally understand of you being original and being different and being disruptive. I know I hate the word disruption because you keep hearing that word, but it's not really, the word is super loose. Everybody's disruptive nowadays, man. Yeah, of course. Everything is disruptive, man. I, I, this I, podcast I, is disruptive. Oh, thank you very much. Buddy. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm going to have that as a quote, but whatever. No problem. Uh, but no, definitely, definitely. But how do you think we can fix that? Well, you see, there's a lot of bad advice out there, and I said it again. You know, I, you know, I've met, um, I've met advisors asking for five to ten percent for managing an advisory board for a startup, and startups accepting it. Yeah. And we, industry standard is is 0.5 percent or 0.25 percent for for an advisor. Uh, we have uh, many non-technical founders that are out there. We need to kind of tell them. We need to be able to tell. Uh, you know, I tell startups, look. You're going to have a hard time. You don't have a technical founder and you want to develop an app. You're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Let's face it. I'm going to tell you from now. And you know what? Meet these four startups who can, who, who agree with me because, because they tried it and it didn't work out that well. Uh, so we need to be very practical and, and talking to them. And there is a way of kind of telling them the bad aspects and the mistakes, but still being positive about it. You know, I know startups who've gone through uh, three seed stage programs oh, and 30% of their companies are already given away. Yeah. And then they come to me and tell me, yeah, I want to do series A. And I'm like, look, you've already given away 30%. Yeah. You have a loaded cap table. Um, you know, series A would want 20, 15 to 20, and then you're going to end up with nothing. And as an investor, we don't want you to kind of not have any of your company or, or have less than 50% because you won't be motivated. So what are you doing? And there are startups as well who are involved in the startup community more than their own industries and more than among their customers. Yep. So, so we have a startup who goes to, to all these kind of startup uh, events, but they don't go to, for example, banking events when they're a fintech company. And all they do is kind of jump from incubator to another, you know, without getting anything done. Uh, so we need as incubators and accelerators, as people who are part of the innovation ecosystem to tell them, look, you've, you already did that, uh, that, you know, that incubator program. And I think, you know, we're not the right choice for you. Now it's hard, right? Because we want we want good startups to kind of join. We have, we want to stamp our names in it, but sure. we have a a responsibility uh, for the ecosystem, 
and and they're gonna look back at us and they're gonna say look look what they made me do yeah so i'm kind of straightforward and when when a startup comes and tells me look i want to join that other uh accelerator in dubai when you just passed an accelerator in bahrain say look is that the best idea yeah. uh, for you you know this is i'm very founder kind of oriented right i'm on the founder side and also there's no such thing as you know being an expert in startups right because once we codify what it means to be a startup and we write it down in the book it becomes convention yeah agreed and convention is boring right and, and not exciting anymore and then now everybody's following it so exactly. so you want to be successful successful in a startup don't be an expert in startups forget about being an expert in how a startup runs be an expert in something unique like your customers be an expert in your prob- the problem that you're trying trying to solve yeah. be an expert in a specific niche in your industry and talk about that that's attractive to investors and there are you know some startups abe you know this right where where they have solutions that are looking for problems you've heard that before many times right so for example there's this guy um who who learned computer vision code there's a lot of startups who have computer vision is is kind of a old hot thing maybe 2 years 3 years ago sure and computer vision oh i know this code is so cool uh and now i have this code and uh it's pretty amazing and i i wonder what startup i can make around it so that's not a good strategy usually it's a very bad strategy when when you have a technology and you're trying to find a solu- a problem to solve rather than look deeply at a problem and come from the problem side and try to find different kind of solutions that could solve that problem 100% and by the way um i think the number one reasons why startups fail is there is no market need or there isn't a product market fit you know what i mean it's not funding people keep talking about uh you know founders you know the first time they meet you know a person like me or even a person like you they like you know they're that mentality of okay let me see how i can get some money off this guy or whatever but then and then and then and you're like wait 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 like what is your problem and they tell you this is, <laughs> and it becomes a passion business and this is another thing i never invest in is passion businesses it has to make sense you know it's not because something happened to that one person or to or we found another person with the same issue that they did something that they can replicate like uh, let me give you an example let me give you something that i always do so i'm going to touch on two points that you mentioned um even like uh, you know our programs start a boot camp in mina I think the last program had 900 applications. Okay? And we honestly eliminated anybody who was uh, already accepted in an accelerator. No matter how cool the company was, but we did not want more people from different accel- cuz I don't want the reason is I don't want to take more equity of something that low. B, I don't even want to uh, start comparing oh well at 500 they do this or at Y combinated none of that. This is the methodology. This is and you know honestly the accelerator and like I'm going to be very controversial when I say this. It, it, the accelerator is all about who's running it. It's not about yes they have a playbook but then the, you know the playbook was written like start a boot camp was written in in Europe that half of that needs to be localized to the you know where, wherever we're offering if it's in Dubai it's in uh, Bahrain GCC uh, Jordan Lebanon you know it has to be localized and you need doors opened in that local country so that's why it has to change and then the other thing is they come and pitch something that like i saw a couple of thousand pitches last last year alone right so we see a lot of duplicates which is fine every once in a while i come and up that. with something like wow and then you look into it and i'm like ah oh, it's a passion business and i get discouraged because that means i need to spend a lot of money on education and i don't know if there's a market for it that's the problem like people don't do that whole sizing exercise or the my my favorite when people say the globe is a 16 trillion dollar and i'm like oh. 16 trillion come on like come on like you the standard <laughs> the standard google search man yeah, uh, yeah what's my industry size oh 20 billion let me just put that on a slide yeah. and you know we're going to get 10% of that that should attract investors that standard top down approach which i am adamant against and when i when i uh, do my lectures i make sure to point that out 100% for sure no. you mentioned uh, you know fundraising is it, fundraising has become That's part cool. of a convention It's a sport. It's 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 crap, man. I'll tell you. Look, let me tell you. When I started my business, and you know that, man, it's about the same time when you started your second business. I started my first one. Hmm. Um, I had to beg and convince my family for funding. Yeah. I had to beg them and and kind of convince them. 
And if I walked into an investor's office and asked for, for money at that time in our region, they'd probably think I was crazy and kick me out. Yeah. And when I received my initial cash and I bought my servers and set up the roots of my company, I definitely did not assume that I was ever going to get any more. That was it. I make it or I break it. Yeah. Today, every startup assumes they're going to get funding. Yeah. And even among investors, the assumption is every startup needs funding. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of the convention that's going on. Because every startup has a runway. And asking, what is your runway? When an investor asks you, what is your runway? They might as well be asking, hey, startup, uh, tell us how much you need us and tell us how we can take advantage of you. Yeah. So my biggest advice before fundraising, try to get rid of the runway yeah. if you can. Yeah. Cut your costs and, and tell them, yeah, we're doing well. We're growing. We're growing and op our operating costs are covered. We're growing at a stable 10%. It's fine. We're looking for funding to speed up our growth. And sorry, yeah, we don't have a runway. You know, fundraising should be a consequence, man, not a goal. I agree. And that's the problem. I agree. Uh, actually, and you touched on something super key right now, which is, uh, you know, controlling the narrative, right? Like if you tell people I want survivor money, well, guess what? That That's never going to happen. But when you go in and say, listen, I need growth or scaling money, even if it's the same, by the way, but the way how you control the narrative is when you start really, you know, you say, listen, I was here six months ago. I'm here now. I can be here. You sell them the future and money will start coming. But if you say, you know, that runway question I hate, and I hate another question, which is the burn. How much money are you burning a month? You know what I mean? Well, secret. <laughs> you know what I mean, like the burn, well, I cannot burn anything if you want. I'll just fire everybody and I won't get paid and uh, I have zero burn, right? So, so okay, let, let me ask you a question. Since you've been working with a lot of people and, and that, in the importance level, what do you think the team is uh, ranked in how important an, inv in an investment should be? Number one, team is number one, for sure. For me, team is number one. But, you know, a team with a bad market is going to be a team that, uh, that's going to fail. So they're all connected, but team is number one. You need, you know, the formidability and the initiative of the founder is what's going to run this company. I'll tell you something, and I know it this way. I'm sitting down and advising a person and telling them a few things. And the next time we meet, they've done everything I told them and more. And they've come with more ideas. While another kind of founder, uh, you tell them everything and they come back and they have the same mistakes. And they're like asking the same questions over and over again. The person who, who, who elevates himself and grows is a person who, who is a doer, yep. not a person who's, who is just a speaker, a person who just wants to be part of, you know, I just want to have a startup. Yep. So team is number one, especially in this crowded environment, for sure. For sure. I, I agree 100%. I think me and you think uh, a lot alike, like, um, you know, keep in mind, you know, we're running our boot camps, uh, whether it's start a boot camp or any hackathon I was involved in. I generally think if the idea is decent, but, but it's all about the team, because you know what, you can always refine the idea and you can always pivot out of the idea. For sure. You know, there's one thing, Abe, that, that is kind of really unconventional and very few startups follow it. And it's actually, it's data and being data driven. Yeah. You know, data-driven is, is one of the top 100 words, yeah. you know, of the past decade. Yeah. But one of the most underutilized in businesses, for sure. You know, only the big companies, you know, the tech companies, they, you know, all this kind of data information. New businesses at all. You know, for the first uh, few years of my first company, now my second one, I, I led the company with heart yeah. and with emotions. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had a big TV in the office with the total customers total number of calls and a bunch of kind of vanity metrics that, that made me feel good. Mm. And it was not until I think two years into the business when competition started coming in uh, because I, I started with no, with fairly little competition. So it was, it was kind of fair game. And, and when competition started coming in, uh, I saw my revenues kind of decline steeply to the point where I was running out of money and I ran out of money a couple of times and I had to do something because I I wasn't in a position where, oh, I'm going to fundraise, you know, which is kind of the attitude right now. I'm going to go fundraise. I had to do something and I started collecting data. And using data, and I'm going to tell you this, I realized 
a simple change in how we build our customers. Tripled our revenue. Nice. Because of data. Because of data, I realized high quality calls that are a bit more expensive resulted in 30% increased call duration. Amazing. Which tripled our revenue. Data is really important. And I think it should be part of every accelerator's first um, session where explain to them, you know what, start collecting data from now. It's so easy to do it now with, with um, Amplitude and with um, Mixpanel and so many kind of apps out there where you can easily just hook it up with 30 minutes of coding yeah. and you can start collecting internal data. 100%. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. We're seeing that a lot right now in e-commerce and all that good stuff. So, um, okay. So I, I promised you that I'm going to ask you a curveball question. My question to you, and I am asking every guest this question. If you have a superpower, okay, what would that be? Or if you would like to mimic a certain superhero, who would that be? Let's see. Batman. I like Batman, man. Batman is my, I like him. He's cool. I'm not a Superman kind of guy. I'm a Batman kind of guy. Okay. You no, know, tough, tough guy. Um, uh, doer of good. Okay. Uh, getting the bad guys. Look, we had a very heated session today. Yeah. Right. I want to get rid of the bad guys. So I guess Batman is it. Nice curveball, man. Nice. Definitely. Nice. Nice. <laughs> I think he's also data driven, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. So. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to leave um, you with like saying the last sentence or last remarks, if you want to tell anybody or our audience anything. Uh, so what would you like to tell people? Uh, I guess I'm going to, if I'm talking to people who want to start a business, um, think twice, uh, think three times before you start your journey. It's life changing and it's, it's possibly not for everyone. You know, I have on more than one occasion kind of wondered if I, if I, if I was better off getting a job, it happened many times. And I can go into the stories of that. You know, the law of numbers are against you on that. Uh, the next one is be unconventional. Stop yourself whenever you realize you're walking the beaten path, right? Mm. Uh, when you're copying everybody else uh, in the room and contemplate uh, whether you can do something different or you can think differently or you can step out and look at what you're doing. You know, the path you choose is yours at the end. Oh. And then the last is, I guess, something that's close to me is uh, be objective and be data-driven from the start. Uh, every startup I advise right now needs to have numbers on the Zoom call. One of the kind of screens needs to be the numbers. Nice. Uh, so that we can discuss based on data. And that's kind of a rule that I have. Nice. Nice. You know, like uh, you know, any mentor or advisor that tells you this is the only way to do something has not seen all the possibilities. Yeah. For sure. I agree. I agree. I agree 100%. Well, thank you very, very much. And thank you, audience, for listening. Until next time, take care. Take care, man. Too short.